好，欢迎来到洛杉矶华资讯网的直播现场，我是主播莉亚。你有患近视吗？甚至高度近视吗？你知道除了激光矫正之外，近视手术最安全、最有效的解决办法是什么吗？近年来，一种被称为是 Evo ICL 晶体植入技术的近视矫正技术，正在悄悄地改变很多人的人生。这项技术呢，相当于是在眼睛里面植入一只隐形眼镜，不需要维护，既可以矫正高达两千度的深度近视。它并不同传统的 LASIK 或者是 Smile， 不需要切缺角膜，手术时间也很短，恢复时间也非常快，因此呢，特别适合角膜薄弱、度数很高的亚洲患者。那今天，为了让大家更加深入了解 Evo ICL 晶体植入的原理和优势，我们特别邀请到来自美国东部全美眼科机构 Boston Vision 的 Dr. Jason Brenner。Dr. Brenner 毕业于哈佛大学医学院，拥有多年的屈光手术经验。他所在的 Boston Vision 是美国东部进行 Evo ICL 手术晶体植入最领先的诊所之一。那在今天节目当中，他将跟我们分享 Evo ICL 晶体植入在临床当中的真实效果、常见的疑问解答，是不是适合亚洲人？同时呢，他会讲解一些他遇到的特别案例，比如说像1900度深度近视的患者如何通过 Evo 重获清晰视力的。首先呢，我们先请医生给我们来打个招呼吧。Hello, Dr. Brenner. Thank you so much for joining us today. Could you please tell me a little bit more about yourself? My name is、uh, Dr. Jason Brenner. I'm a cataract and refractive surgeon here at Boston Vision. I、uh, finished my training in 2015 and joined the practice afterwards. So I've been here for about 10 years, and I really enjoy ICL surgery. Thank you. I heard you have done over 1,000 Evo ICL surgeries. That's impressive. So, what made you choose to specialize in Evo ICL, and why the latest generation of the Evo lens stand out? We've been doing ICL since it was FDA approved, you know, over a decade ago. And when Evo ICL came around, it really helped us be more confident in the surgery and start doing a lot more. We've probably done over a thousand of them since then. For those people who are new to the concept, so what exactly is Evo ICL lens, and what is the material? Why it is permanent? Does it need to be removed in the future? The beauty of ICL surgery really is in the material that the lens is made out of, and this material is pretty time tested. We've been using the same polymer to make lenses for the last twenty years or so, and what we've changed over time is the design of the lens, not necessarily the material. And we know that it lasts for as long as we've been using it. So for the vast majority of people, ICL is with them throughout their lifetime until eventually, when they're older, they have cataract surgery. So it is not something that you need to replace. If somebody who has ICL implantable lens develops cataracts later in the life, so what happens then? If you get a cataract, which everyone will at some point in life, it's it's normal. It's part of aging. Um, the same thing happens as if you never had an ICL, which means we can do the cataract surgery just like normal. The only difference is we take the ICL out while we're doing it, and the beauty of it is you are you keep your eye open to every possible lens implant in the future. One downside to LASIK laser vision correction is that there are certain lens implants we don't like to use at the time of cataract surgery if you've had a big laser treatment, and so ICL maintains your natural cornea, and you can do whatever kind of cataract surgery in the future. So two things: if you have LASIK, it is a little bit more challenging to calculate the power of your future lens implant with cataract surgery. We've gotten pretty good at that that now because it's so common that we have to deal with that situation. And the second is there are certain multifocal lens implants that do not work well if you've had a large laser treatment before, and ICL does not、uh, does not cause any issues with those lenses. So it leaves all of your options open to you in the future. Asian eyes can be different. They tend to be more smaller and narrow in lens. So, how do you make sure the lens fits properly in Asian eyes? The surgery is safe for these kind of the patients. So, one of the most important things when you're looking at doing ICL surgery is we have to make sure there's enough space in the front of your eye to put an ICL,、mm-hmm. which makes intuitive sense. You have to have room for this lens. And if there's not enough room, it can increase your chance of having eye pressure issues or cataracts or things like that.、Mm-hmm. Uh, Asian patients in general tend to have long eyes, which is why they're so nearsighted.、Mm-hmm. But the space where we put the lens tends to be a little bit smaller than、um, non-Asian patients. So the the advantage, though, is that because Asian patients are so nearsighted, we have tons of experience putting ICLs in those patients, and so we've learned how to size appropriately. But it's true. Occasionally, we come across a patient who just doesn't have enough space, and we say, "Sorry, you're not a candidate for ICL."
um, but you know we do it all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing that we know is that the uh, the FDA labeling in the United States is a little bit more conservative than what labels we see around the world. You know, in China, South Korea, and part of that's just because the study was done a long time ago, and those numbers really have not been updated. Mm -hmm. So. We do off-label ICLs all the time for patients that have um, a little bit less space than what uh, we typically see here in the United States. And we base that on our experience around the world, and we know that it's safe to do. So beyond the standard FDA-approval uh, measurements, do you use any other additional tools or technologies to improve the accuracy and results? So white-to-white -white is basically measuring the size of your cornea. And when we do that, we're using it as a surrogate marker for the space of where we're going to put the lens because it's a little bit more challenging to actually measure that space inside the eye. We can do it with ultrasound, but ultrasound has its own issues with how it's being measured. Um, and we also use uh, OCT and other sizing measurements. OCT is a specialized picture of the eye. And so we put all of this data together in multiple different calculators to help guide us on what size of lens to put in because we don't want to rely on just one data point and assume that that's the correct one because humans are all different. We all have different eyes and, and so sometimes they don't quite fit the, the one nomogram. So we use a lot of different ways to calculate it. I heard you have been trained patients with extremely high myopia, like minus 16 diopter or even minus 19 diopters. That's incredible. And tell me more about that. ICL has its origins in dealing with patients that are very nearsighted. And so today we happen to have two patients that are so nearsighted that the ICL can't even correct all of their prescription. It can correct about 16, but you can do it in patients even higher. And we know we're going to have to come back later and do a little bit of laser treatment to clean up the rest of their prescription. But still, it's a great option to get rid of that large amount of their nearsightedness to bring them to a range where we can safely do LASIK. Mm -hmm. Um, and with that experience over the last 10 or 20 years of doing ICL in very nearsighted people, we now know how to do it safely and we offer ICL to the whole range of prescriptions ranging from minus 3 up to minus 20. Some people are concerned about long-term safety and there is a fear that ICL may can damage the endothelial cells over time. So is it something that patients need to be worried about? So. In the space where we're working on the inside of the cornea, there are cells and those cells, their job is to help keep your cornea clear. And we all lose some of those cells throughout lifetime. That's normal aging. And, but when you do surgery inside the eye, you always lose a few more cells, which is true of ICL surgery also. That is a, in my opinion, is a one-time thing, right? So we do the surgery, you lose some cells. The ones that are there remodel and move around and fill in the space. So if you look at the cornea and take pictures every couple of months, every year or two, there's a little bit of change over time, but eventually it levels out because we're not doing anything else to the eye after your surgery. So um, when you look long term over time, most of the change that's happening over time is something that would happen anyway, because we all lose those cells throughout lifetime. If you go in and do another surgery down the road, if you move the ICL or change it or something like that, sure, you're going to move, lose more cells. Or if you go have cataract surgery 40 years in the future, yes, you're going to lose more cells. But it's really not a big issue in terms of long-term change over time. And, you know, we have been doing this surgery for a long time. And if we thought that these lenses were going to cause issues over time, we would have seen it by now. And so uh, we just know that it's not a long-term risk to the cornea. Now I wanted to shift the gears a little bit. You had LASIK yourself, right? So tell me more about your vision correction journey. I had a pretty low prescription and I didn't really wear my glasses that often. But when I got into the surgical world, we were often doing surgery and looking at a screen across the room to verify an implant or do our timeout for safety or things like that. And I was just sitting there kind of squinting at the screen and Dr. Melky looked at me, he's like, you should probably check your glasses prescription and see if it's changed over time and had gotten a little bit higher. So at the end of my fellowship, Dr. Melke did LASIK for me, um, and it's been great ever since. And I also have monovision, which is something we talk to patients a lot about, just like Dr. Melke, who has monovision. So my right eye is distanced, my left eye is a little undercorrected for reading, and it helps me you know, read in my everyday life. And you actually performed light adjustable lens surgery on your mentor, Dr. Samuel Malki, who is also the founder of Boston Vision. So what is the, exactly the surgery like? And it must mean a lot to you. 
So the light adjustable lens is awesome. One of the things that has always challenged us in cataract surgery is predicting the exact power of the lens implant to put in because everyone's eye is a different size and shape and that lens can settle into its final position where it wants to be in different ways. And so there has always been a margin of error in terms of how perfect your prescription is afterwards. That's not an issue for health or safety, but it is an issue for how much you have to wear glasses. And as surgeons, we're all perfectionists and it always bothered us that we could take all this time predicting the lens that we want to put in and we put it in and we're wrong and it's off by a little bit. And that's particularly an issue in people that have LASIK before because it's harder to calculate the implant for LASIK patients. And so um, this lens was invented as a solution to that problem. So all of the variables that happen before surgery, all the variables that happen during surgery don't matter because we can fine tune this lens afterwards. So we do the surgery, we let the eye heal, we wait a month or so, and then we come back and we use light to adjust the shape of the, the power of the lens that's already inside your eye. And we can really fine tune that prescription to get LASIK-like accuracy. And that's really cool. Um, it's a little bit more work for patients to come back for these visits and adjustments. But once we get that lens where we want it to be and lock it in place, it's great. And so we've seen this over the last few years as a really accurate way to do cataract surgery. And I did it in my own mother, I did it in my father-in-law, and now in my mentor and partner, Dr. Melky. So it's really the most accurate thing we have now in cataract surgery. In your experience, what is the biggest misconcept about evil ICL and how do people get wrong most often? Very common question I get is about halos. Uh, it's very common in all refractive surgery procedures to see halo for a period of time. And that's true with ICL also. Some of that comes just from the nature of having this lens inside the eye. Some of it comes from that little opening in the center, which is the magic opening that really has made ICL a much safer procedure in the long run. And so uh, I always advise most of my patients that you'll see halos for a period of time. For the vast majority, that goes away on its own. And for a small percentage of patients who still see it, they are so happy with their vision otherwise that they don't care if they see a few halos here or there. Uh, we've had one patient in the last five years that you know, saw the halos and had trouble getting over it. And they said, you know what, this is just not for me. I want you to remove this lens. And we said, sure. We took it out and they went back to glasses or contacts. And that's one of the amazing things about the ICL is that it really is removable. So if for any reason you don't like it, you have any issues, you need to change it, something better comes up down the road in you know, 10 years, we can just take it out and move on to the next thing. You have helped so many patients. Is there one evil ICL case that makes you really memorable or maybe something that is really emotional or unexpected? Well, I think this one was kind of emotional. It wasn't necessarily complicated, but it was life-changing for a patient. So I had an ICL, or I had a patient who was very nearsighted, and she actually was born congenitally without hands. And so she could not put contacts in easily. She was married, and her husband could put contacts in for her, and um, you know she was able to put her glasses on. But it was a big lifestyle issue, just that she couldn't manage this on her own. And I forget what her prescription was. It was high, like minus you know, 12 or 15 or something like that. And so when ICL came around and the Evo one, which we felt very safe about, we offered it to her and she had ICL surgery and it was amazing. It was life changing for her to just not have to worry about this routine and rely on her husband or someone else to put her contacts in for her. And so it's just a patient I'll never forget because it was such a unique situation. And her situation magnified what everyone else goes through in their everyday life. They don't like putting in contacts. It's a pain. They have to remember to do it. They have to take them out. And all of those things are, were, were much more prominent for her because of just her you know, situation with her anatomy. And so um, it's just a patient that always resonates with me. Thank you so much, Dr. Brenner, for joining us today. 那大家也是可以扫描屏幕上方的二维码来联系Boston Vision 或者是呢可以添加Boston Eye这个微信号来进行免费咨询 那值得注意的是呢Boston Vision 它是美国东部进行最多Evo ICL和LASIK激光手术的视力诊所 他们的创始人Dr. Samuel Malky 不仅是在美国很有名 而且在国际上和英国呢更是将领先的人工角膜技术带入到这些国家里面 所以呢在国际上也是享誉声誉整个医生团队都是哈佛医生团队，而且他们的价格比同行都要低出百分之三十，还提供零利率的分期付款。好了，以上就是今天节目的全部内容了。Thank you so much, Dr. Brenner, for joining us today. 我们下期节目有关于近视的话题，继续和您聊，不见不散。